This is a Marshall Enterprises presentation. Happy Friday, everybody. Welcome to another broadcast But Brownsville LLC. I hope everybody's doing well. I hope everybody's maintaining and doing their best to uh, avoid and mitigate this uh, pandemic. What I need to bring to your attention today, those that actually pay attention to me, after this video, I'm going to leave an email and I'm going to leave a way of contacting me privately and securely. I have a couple of groups of which I communicate with and I advise. And there are a lot of people that follow me on Facebook that listen to my videos, watch my videos, of which would like to do something in their own area or perhaps join the network. And I'm going to do more reaching out. I like to keep my circles small, although there's a lot of people looking for assistance that have unique abilities, unique trades, unique skills of which could, uh, could, be, could be very valuable to what we are doing. With that being said, this video is about disruption. When the military engages in an operation and deploys their resources, resources being physical material, whether it be tanks and uh, people to a location, they do it strategically and they do it in a very thought out planned way. Why am I bringing it up now? Because there are a lot of things that are going on of which you as the lay person gets the least amount of information and you don't always get the truthful information. However, those of us that have a certain type of training can see through a lot of the stuff that's happening and can more or less, what's the word, telegraph? You know, we can see what's coming. We can see how these things are unraveling. The military does a few things. They compartmentalize information, whereas the Navy has a set of things to do. They have an objective. The Air Force have an objective. The Army has an objective. The Coast Guard, etc. All these different units of the military have their own duty, their own objective. And only the upper echelon of those units know what the other unit is getting ready to do. So if you take it in stages, infantry has a job to go in and shoot, <laughs> shoot and kill, you know, clear out an area. Whereas the Navy SEALs already went in first to plant information or to kind of pave the way for them to disrupt communication lines, et cetera. So everybody has a particular plan and it all works for the greater good of the mission. So when compartmentalization takes place, this person or this group doesn't know what this group is doing. This group doesn't know what this group is doing, but there are individuals or entities above them that are pulling the strings and coordinating the events. That makes sense. A lot of the tech, um, a lot of the tactics that the military uses, so does your local police departments to a small degree, like the special services and different things. And if there is a hostage situation, immediately teams are deployed to perhaps disrupt communication 
in that area, that local area. Maybe they'll temporarily take down a cell phone tower so they can direct their communications at the, the target, the, you know, the, um, they call it unsub. They, they, they can direct their communication directly at that individual. They can tap into that phone line and call that house. They may not have a tel telephone number, but they can pinpoint, you know, who they're calling it. So they, they disrupt and they pinpoint who they're contacting. At the same time, the gas lines may be turned off. The power may be turned off. These things cause confusion because now if the person that is held up in that house was looking at themselves on TV, now the power line is cut off. They can't see what they're doing because if you watch yourself on TV and they're showing the secret service or not secret service, the special forces, I'm calling special, the, you know, they get, the tactical teams are getting into position. But if you're watching it on TV, it may give away some of their location. So what they do is they disrupt the communication, disrupt, you know, your, um, they disrupt things. Water, uh, gas, telephone, electricity. So now you got to sit in a dark house, no water flowing. And now you got to think about what you're going to do. And this is done on a larger scale. When they invade a, uh, an area, they cut off resources to that area and sometimes they play the waiting game we'll wait it out a week we'll wait it out. when they did that to um that group in texas forgive me for not giving you an exact name it was a group in texas on a uh, a ranch what they did was they cut off the resources to them and they waited it out okay they'll be hungry soon you know they don't have any water so you know we'll wait them out but these tactics are used all the time and if you are prepper minded, if you are uh, military science minded, you know, if you have this mindset, you know what you, you have an idea of what you need to do to, you, need, you know what you need to do in those instances. And you can't wait until you're in an emergency to prepare. You should be preparing prior. So again, these different things are cut off. What do you now do to prepare? So what do you do to prepare for these different things? Let's take the current climate that we're in right now. And if you notice the food pantries, you notice uh, not many people. If you're not essential, you can't go to work. So people are depleting their resources at home. There's a lot of people that will not go to food banks. You know, they, they don't have much food. You know, they're eating very, very little, but their pride or whatever it is will not allow them to go wait in line to go get some food. And they have no money to spend in the store. You have people that don't know how to cook. All they do is eat out. But the supermarket, not supermarkets, but the, the restaurants in these different places are closed now. What do they do? They're eating cereal, eating oodles and noodles. They're not eating too healthy. But moving right along. So when the military moves into an area or when the local law enforcement moves into an area, what they do is they disrupt things. So again, using the current climate that we're in right now, you saw a rush on water. You saw a rush on toilet paper and cleaning supplies. Preppers such as myself have an abundance of this stuff stored up. We don't wait until an emergency to now try to go out and get these things. On average, when I go to the supermarket, I would get 10 to 20, usually 20, 20 gallons of water at a time. And once this, um, this pandemic hit, supermarkets were limiting the amount of water that you can get. You can only get two gallons now. Some places you only get one gallon. So what do you do with a family of seven that needs water and you can only get two gallons at a time when it's limited like that? How do you prepare in the future for the same type of situation? There are units that you can purchase. 
that holds several gallons of water. You should look into purchasing these things and use this as you do your regular cooking. So the water is constantly being used, but it's also staying fresh. Meaning you get a hundred gallon tank, you fill it up. As you need water, use it and put the water back. Whatever means you use, whether you're using water from the tap that you pre-filter, okay, you pre-filter it and you put it into the tank. You want to use the water in the tank so it doesn't become stale or develop any issues. But yet you still have that capacity on hand in the event that something happens. Okay, make sense? I'll try to put some pictures up here of some suggestions of what you should get. That's water. Another tip about water, a lot of people go buy the bundles of individually bottled water. If you look on the side of the bag and look at how much or how many gallons or liters that you're purchasing, usually three gallons, three individual gallons is more than that case of 24 waters. The numbers may be off. I'm just giving you a, uh, give you something to think about. So you don't got a case of water. You got them individually bottled. Each bottle holds um, 500 milliliters. If you compare that to a gallon, how many of these does it take to make a gallon? If it takes 24 of these to make two gallons, you see the difference? So you got four cases of these when you could have got 20 gallons of water and you had much more. All right, you made the point, let's move on. Communications is also disrupted. Cell phones will be off, landlines will be off. How do you communicate? I constantly keep showing it. It's a Baofeng UV82. It is a scanner and it is a ham radio. It also does XMR. Uh, um, I'm going to put the link up. Every time I do a video, the words just don't come out. You can do short range radio to radio communication. You can also do long range communications. This is pre-programmed to listen to police and emergency services. I can also transmit on that if I need to, an emergency, emergency. So what do you do? I have an extended antenna that goes on top of the car, it's magnetic. So it increases the range of this can you do? These are different things that you can do. They different things that you should do. Let's move on to food. When this hits, a lot of people are going to the supermarket and racking up on meat, racking up on perishables, stuff that needs to go in a refrigerator or frozen. If the power goes out, that whole bunch of perishables that you purchase is no longer good or you're going to have to eat it before it actually goes bad 
Do you have tons of ice on hand? Do you have dry ice? No, you don't. You need to consider a food source that will withstand the test of time and will still provide you with the nutrients that you need to sustain. And the number one or number two items, but you can't use honey every day, but honey is one and rice is another. Rice has an indefinite shelf life. As long as you keep it in a sealed container, a sealed airtight container or a bag, rice you can have indefinitely. You should have a lot of rice on hand at your disposal. You also might want to consider doing things that are portable. Portable meaning any event of emergency, you need to leave this location in a hurry. You can grab one or two gallons of water. You can grab bags of rice and put it in your go bag or your packs and put it in the car and go. You're not going to be bringing boxes of burgers. You know, you know, you're not going to, there's certain things you're just not going to be good. You're not going to be grabbing. You're going to grab the things that you can cook right away and use right away. Non-perishable stuff. Sardines, one of my favorite. Packages and packages of sardines. That one package of sardine will fill me up every day. I've gotten my, my diet down to a point where one boiled egg and a can of sardines lasts me all day. As long as I'm drinking up all my water, I'm good. Are you the same? Are you one that need three burgers? You need, you know, a, a bucket of chicken? You're going to have hell when and if the heat gets hotter. Got to keep these things in mind. Communication, um, water, food, power. In the event your power goes off, the grid is cut. There's a, uh, a storm and the power lines go down. Trust me, resources are, are going to be deployed to the critical areas, meaning the hospitals, the nursing homes, the, the utility places like uh, the police department, all of those places are gonna be taken care of first and then they'll come to you. What do you do to sustain until your lights get back on? And what if your lights don't come back on? Talk about this in another video as well. This is one of the things in my arsenal. It's a power inverter. Goes in a car, hooks up to the battery, and in the event of an emergency, you can plug right up to it and keep the refrigerator going. I can keep my computers going, maybe charge my laptop, charge my phone, and an actual generator. If you are in a project complex or you're in a apartment complex where you cannot run a generator, can't do it indoors, you can't run a cord from your car to the 12th floor, what do you do then? You might want to consider solar panels of which you can put outside the window. There are different things that you can do, but you have to start planning in the event. If you live in an apartment comp complex and you're on X floor, anything above the third or fourth floor, what do you do for power? You got to start thinking of this stuff. I live in a house, so I can pull my car right next to the window let it run and run a cord out to the car and power my refrigerator, run a few lights. I can hook up my generator to the back and run it into my main switch and turn my light, we turn my house lights back on. Not everybody has the same means. So I can't give you a one size fit all solution, but I can let you know that you need to start thinking of these things. Cause you cannot, you, you see now how you cannot rely on local government and local officials to supply you with the things that you need. How long into the pandemic were they giving out masks and telling you just put a scarf around your face? That's not sufficient. You need to get these things yourself and be prepared. The very next video is going to talk about even more privacy features. And one of which I'm going to show you now. Notice my camera is covered. I've researched, not researched, but I've done some digging around in the deep web and I came across a website. 
of which I still can't find today. The website shows live images of people's phones, laptops, or computers that have a camera attached to it. You know how you've seen the Zoom parties where all of the images of everybody is on the screen? That same image showed people walking and playing on their phones. It was a, a wall of it. And it had something to do, it said something about insecurity. That's not the name of the website, but it was speaking of insecurity. So from seeing that, I immediately taped up my camera. <laughs> wow. But that's for another video, another time. You got to be mindful of what is going on and what you need to do. There are people now that are bored out of their mind. They've been home a lot of days of which <clears throat> couldn't wait to be home. There's people that wait to Fridays to go you know, party and do their thing on the weekends, but their weekends now have been extended because they're home every day and don't know what to do with themselves. So they're shopping either online or going to the stores, going to Walmart, and Kmart, all these different places, and buying a lot of unnecessary shit as, a, as opposed to buying the things that you need to sustain in an environment such as one that we're in now. I hope this causes some more people to think about what they're doing and how they're doing it. And be mindful that, yeah, this is going to pass, but when? How long are you going to be able to sustain? Some of us, like myself, I'm essential. I still, I'm still employed. I'm still getting a paycheck. I run other businesses and I have other revenue coming in, but there are people that are out of work and they're relying on unemployment. They're relying on food stamps. They're relying on government assistance. What happens when that's cut off? Are you growing your own food? Do you have the means to grow your own food? Could you possibly go to your local park and plant some fruits and vegetables inconspicuously somewhere so that in the future, in the event that you need to go find some food, you can go to the park because it'll be growing wild, but it'll be growing and you know, you planted it, you know it's there. You can't eat grass. There's grass in front on your lawn outside your like in miles. There's grass outside my house grass in the backyard that's not edible why not plant some edible plants and herbs of which in an emergency like this you can just go out to the back go out to the front and get you something to eat grow your own food there's vegetables and herbs that you can grow indoors find out these things yes i can put links up on all this stuff here i'm more of the, the from the, the school of i'm showing you and explain it to you what can be. Figure it out, look for it. I can give you all the answers. That means I'm just doing all the work. I want us to do the work. Build with me. Show me some things that you've done. Show me some things that you know about, as opposed to coming here and just figuring it out. Now, don't get me wrong, I love those videos when they show you piece by piece by piece and do this, do this, do this. those are great. However, I have a unique, group of people that follow me and watch my videos and they appreciate me giving these little morsels i do give you more but i want my people to think for themselves i am not the type that's gonna feed you a fish i'm gonna teach you how to fish okay i thank you for watching i really really hope this gets more people to think about what could be, what should be. <clears throat> we need to help one another and I can't have all the resources and feed my neighborhood. I need my neighborhood to be just like that armed forces compartmentalized. My neighbor's growing corn, not really, but you know, my other neighbor's growing potatoes. 
I'm growing cucumbers and we're helping one another. You know, I have the 350 gallon water tank. And if my neighbors need some water, okay, they come to me and get some water, but they bring some of their resources. So we're sharing. We're, we're, it's a community effort. We're not waiting for the government. We are helping one another. This is what we need to do. This is what we have to do. And what better time to do it than now? Once this thing is over and the basketball games come back on and the movies open back up, everybody's going to forget about prepping and planning. Because now it's time to go to the club. And now it's time to go to the ball game. Then the next pandemic happens. And you're right back at the same point. You have nothing. Don't let that be you. Please don't let that be you. Peace and power. Take care of yourself, everybody.